do you think there's enough money in professional esports to make that transition to IRL racing? Uh, no. <laughs> oh man, there are going to be some unpopular opinions in this video. <laughs> Racing esports is more popular than ever. More fans, more games, more teams, more prize money. And despite that, proven esports champions like James Baldwin are having to resort to crowdfunding just to stay in the race car. A feeling that I know all too well. And it's also kind of the reason I refused every opportunity I've had to compete in esports. And in this video, we'll be interviewing current pro esports drivers and we'll get into exactly why I don't compete online professionally professionally and why you might not want to either. Well, at least if your end goal is to race in real life. It's worth noting that not every sim racer has the goal of becoming a pro driver on or off screen, and that's totally fine. I genuinely think it's one of the best hobbies out there. But with that being said, I am a competitor through and through, and that's the side of sim racing that I want to evaluate today. So let's assume for the purpose of this video that you're an esports driver who's looking to leverage their career for real life racing. So let's go ahead and break this apart. So the first aspect I want to talk about in this chapter is time. Time is a problem in real life motorsports as well as in esports, but in real life motorsports, your time is more limited by how much money you have to spend. You also have a lot of team personnel, so those people need to go on holidays or just can't physically travel every single day of the year. Well, maybe in Formula One they can. <laughs> In real life motorsports, time is limited also by how much testing you're allowed to do from a regulations point of view. They limit the amount of time so that if you had an unlimited budget, you couldn't in theory use it. Although there are definitely loopholes for that. You didn't see anything. But in esports, it's totally different. All you need is a PC, a wheel, and you might not even need an internet connection. And you can spend all day, every day practicing for your upcoming event. This is Colin Spork, a driver for Alpine Esports who won an R-Factor 2 World Championship in his first full season of racing. And on the topic of time, this is what he had to say. Um, I think it's mainly the dedication. Calculating it, I had an average of six hours, seven hours per day so over a span of three years. So that's 365 days a year. When you're dedicated and you want something as bad as, you, as I want, you can do it. So that leads me to the second point, which is a potential lack of social life if you want to really compete at a high level. I finished my, my high school uh, during the year that I was doing the World Championship. Uh, after that, I took a year off from uh, now the last year, I took a year off from school. And I am so dedicated in my racing that I really gave up a lot of my, of my, of my personal life as well. Well, friends, uh, events, these type of things. Yeah. I just want to be a racing driver. I just yeah. want to be a professional. I want to be a world champion. And this is a problem in real life racing as well. And to give you an example, I'll use myself here. So early in my real life racing career, I thought that the only way to be truly competitive was to only think about motorsports apart from school, which I still found very valuable. So I ended up moving to a new continent away from my friends and family, putting every bit of attention I had into racing. So if I wasn't doing schoolwork, I was reading notes, looking through onboards, or I was on my simulator, or I was physical training, doing all the things I should be doing, right? Even though I enjoy doing all those things for the most part, when you do it that religiously, it very easily leads to burnout. And that kind of made me an unhappy person who had to rely on race wins for any form of gratification, which is just not really sustainable. But I ended up figuring out years later that if I learned to switch race mode on and off and actually enjoy my time off track as much as I enjoy it on track, I ended up being much happier with better performance overall. And I quickly went from just getting podiums to actually winning a championship. And I bring that up because I think it's much harder to do that in esports when everybody has an unlimited budget. Now, the third thing you might have to deal with as a pro esports driver is toxicity. And to help me speak on this subject, I interviewed Swelly Almeida, who's been a regular on this channel, a pro esports coach and champion. Have you ever experienced toxicity in esports? Daily. <laughs> really? I mean, it's just part of the, of the I don't know, it's part of the community. Motorsports has been a, a toxic yes. uh, sport since, the, since its beginning, honestly, yeah. because it's a competitive environment and you want to be better than the others. And I think that kind of like spills over personality and you trying to show that you're better. And like one thing that happens to me, for example, is like 99% of my business is, is with coaching, not with competing. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of that, I, of course, course my driving level is going down a little bit i'm not super sharp because i'm not spending the time practicing i'm spending the time creating lessons and, and doing coaching sessions and creating right. youtube content instagram content yeah. uh, and then whenever i go and drive if you go to my twitch chat is full of like toxic kids just saying like shit and stuff <laughs> so <laughs> it's very common to see and those are the top 200 drivers the ones who should be example a good example for others this sometimes becomes the image of esports 
So just be ready, not everyone's gonna be your friend. And that goes for any competitive environment. The fourth and final point of this chapter I wanna talk about has been hotly debated recently on YouTube and that's all right, hold up, hold up. This is definitely different content that I'm used to producing, but if you guys find value out of this, please consider subscribing or giving this video a like. It will definitely help me out a ton. Cheating in sim racing. Now, I was pretty surprised to find out that there basically isn't any anti-cheat across most of these games, which just seems wrong to me. Now, of course, I'm in the opinion that cheating just doesn't make sense in sim racing, especially if you're using it as a way to get a professional career eventually, but not everyone has that intent and some people just find the entertainment out of messing with other people. So I only mention this because if one game has a better anti-cheat over another in the future, it might actually be worth considering to only focus your attention on that as you go up the ranks because there's no point in wasting time joining time trial events and qualifiers where cheaters could potentially be in the mix. Of course, cheating is a problem in real life motorsports, but there's definitely a lot more effort put on the regulatory side of it that I wouldn't really consider it much of an issue. So you've had some success in esports and you're given the opportunity to drive in a real life race car. Well, here's some good news. Sims have gotten extremely realistic. I mean, for me personally, it was because of iRacing that I was able to go straight from indoor electric karting to real life race cars, skipping over the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars I would have had to have spent on competitive karting. But don't just take it from me. Bro, I had 99% of it mm. already. It was the weirdest feeling ever to get into a car and then not know what to do with the belts. And I know nothing and I feel like, okay, this is this is weird. But then as soon as I look forward and like accelerate, I know everything. The second positive is that if you've been successful up to this point in esports, chances are you've had great media training or you're just naturally good on camera. You might even have a big social media following. All of that is gonna come into play into becoming a successful real life driver as well. So having that experience before you've ever stepped foot in a race car already puts you miles ahead in terms of other drivers who took the more traditional route through karting. But unfortunately, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. In real life racing, you're gonna have to experience a lot of travel fatigue and you're gonna definitely need your physical fitness if you're driving in formula cars, especially. Now, I did a video recently where I tested how many calories I could burn in a sim racing environment and it ended up being quite a bit, although the results were slightly questionable. But the point is, if you have a high force feedback wheel and a stiff set of pedals, you could definitely get a proper workout. But let me tell you from personal experience, it's definitely nowhere near enough to drive a real race car. And even if you did have a pretty beefy setup, most esports drivers are not gonna be running at those settings because it's just not the most efficient way to drive. They'll wanna keep their force feedback generally a little bit lower, as low as they possibly can get it while still having detail. That's obviously not gonna be great training if you're trying to get your muscular strength up for real life racing. So the moral of the story is, if that real life racing opportunity even seems remotely on the horizon, you better be ready physically. The fourth point in this chapter is, which one do you focus on the most, esports or real life racing? If you're all of a sudden gonna get the opportunity to drive a full season of a real life race car, well, your esports career is probably not gonna just disappear overnight. So you're gonna have to focus on both. And just like real life drivers who try and do two championships, I'm definitely guilty of this one. It's very hard to switch hats between different cars, let alone switch between esports and real life racing, which definitely have more differences than similarities when you really get into the details of it. So be honest with yourself, which one are you gonna sacrifice more of? The fifth point is about collaboration. If you're racing in a real life racing team, at least a bigger one, you might have to deal with dozens of people on a regular basis. As the driver, you end up becoming the center point of the entire organization. Sure, you might not be dictating orders to everybody, but it's up to you to keep the team morale high above all else. And blaming other people for mistakes that they may or may not have made, it's gonna end up bringing the morale of the team down with you. And the results are just not gonna be there. Now, I think some of the bigger esports teams have more of a traditional motorsports management system, but I think a lot of the blame ends up getting put on the driver more often than not in esports. So just be ready to take issues on the chin, even if they're not your fault. And the sixth and final point I'll make in this chapter is not all cars are created equal. Not all real life race cars, that is. Now, sure, there might be some setup differences between teams teams in esports, but if you look at the lap times in let's say F1 esports, it's remarkably close. And that's because there is a pretty easily achieved theoretical optimum. Well, maybe not easily achieved, but it seems like people are pretty close on setups. In real life, that's definitely not the case. There are huge disparities between budgets across teams. I mean, some teams in F3 will be charging double or triple what the lower end teams will. And with that extra money comes more development, more testing, even if it's illegal. But that's just how motorsports has always worked. And there can be often seconds of difference between teams, especially in the higher level competitive series. So if you're used to being able to just identify a problem and fixing it yourself, that just might not be the case in a real life motorsports environment. I mean, I'd always recommend blaming yourself first before blaming anyone else, but it might just be the car. And that can be really, really frustrating. 
Do you think there's enough money in professional esports to make that transition to IRL racing? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> to get the money, uh, connections, marketing, and figuring out other ways around that it's not only competing. Back when I started sim racing in 2014, 2015, there were very few esports competitions that I was really aware of. The prize pools were definitely a lot lower than they are today. And so I never really even viewed esports as a viable career path, which certainly isn't the case today. But I got very lucky because at 14 years old, I was relatively fast on iRacing when there weren't a whole lot of 14 year olds on the platform at all. So all it took was one person to take notice of that. And they put me in touch with all the motorsports contacts I needed to get my foot in the door. Now, I think that story is pretty unlikely in today's day age, especially considering back then most of the teammates that I came across didn't even have simulators in the first couple of years I was racing. I was always the sim guru and teams would actually often ask me to help them develop their own sims, even a few manufacturers asked me to develop their simulators. But nowadays being good on a sim as well as in real life is just expected. But these days sim racing prize pools are increasing to astronomical levels. Six and seven figures are becoming the norm and it seems like the trajectory is heading in a good direction. But what I don't think a lot of people take into consideration is that that those prize pools, even if they're a pretty astronomical number, still don't really match up with the kind of money you need to be successful in motorsports. A lot of times these prize pools as well are, well, as they say, pools. They're being divided up amongst the full grid of drivers. And even after, let's say the winner receives their prize money, there may be deductions for their race team, management, and whoever else has their fingers in the pie. Don't get me wrong though, you can absolutely make a great salary in esports. Because in real life motorsports, the sponsorship works from the bottom up rather than the top down, like in esports generally, it means that the second year of your motorsports career will end up being really, really tough. So in this example, I've assumed that the first year was entirely funded. So after you've completed your first year, regardless of how successful or unsuccessful you are, you're gonna be treated as probably as any other driver. So that means you're gonna have regular driver problems, which is finding the money. Okay, so I, I don't wanna make this video sound like it's all bad news, there's no hope. Because honestly, I think there's a ton of opportunity here. I mean, for starters, look how much esports and sim racing has grown in just a few short years. This industry is honestly still in its infancy and who knows, maybe all these problems will be irrelevant in two or three years. Before we get into actually how Swellio made the transition to IRL Motorsports, let's talk about some other success stories. Now, two of the most talented guys I've raced against in real life actually started out as pro gamers. Chem Bullock Bossy actually made the transition from F1 Esports to GT4 in 2019, and then he raced with me in Euro Formula in 2021, followed by F2, and then now Super Formula in Japan. Igor Fraga is another name that comes to mind, uh, a driver I actually raced against in FIA F3 in 2020, and who actually beat hometown hero Liam Lawson in the Toyota Racing Series that same year. A very, very impressive feat indeed. And now Igor also races in Japan in Super Formula Lights. On the scholarship side of things, iRacing has the robust Skip Barber scholarship program, and real life championships and teams are starting to value sim racing as well. I mean, I just learned about the Fanatec GT World Challenge Series. Now, I might be actually super late to the party, here, but they actually host LAN events during every race weekend. And those LAN events in The Sims actually have real points implications to the team championship. I'm sorry, but if that doesn't give you hope for the sim racing industry, then I don't know what will. My way was really through lots and lots and thousands of hours of coaching and saving. Yeah. Um, yeah. And even though I've done that for two years, all my money disappeared in one season. Uh, yeah. that lasted four months. So it's not something that is like sustainable. You have to, to study a lot the means to get the funding to race in real life. It's difficult even for people who already have a, a real life background, imagine, so. Honestly, I think most of the issue here comes from real life racing and the problems that that business model it presents. And since most of the money from real life racing comes from trickle up, it means that all that burden falls on the driver. And that's no different whether a driver's coming from esports or not. But the way drivers who weren't already wealthy became successful in motorsports typically comes from them starting a business that is somewhat related to cars or motorsports. And they use that business as a way to leverage their network and ultimately generate their own sponsorship. And ideally that's a business that has clients where someone could benefit from having the experience of bringing clients to the racetrack. Something that's greater than just having a logo on a race suit. But now we're well into the digital age and I don't think a lot of drivers have caught on to this. I mean, take a YouTuber like Jimmy Broadpent, for example. He's not a particularly competitive esports driver. He didn't have any prior real life racing experience, but through the power of marketing impressions through his YouTube channel, he's had access to real life motorsports that I think any of us would kill for. And now Jimmy's trying to pay 
get forward through his Team 87 program where he's trying to give sim racers a direct opportunity to drive a real life race car, basically funded by him. Now I had the chance to meet Jimmy at an Alpine F1 event recently, and Jimmy's very, very passionate about this subject, as am I. The whole point of this channel is to make racing accessible, and I think as we grow, we're going to be able to make that possible not just for myself, but for many of you guys as well. But the beauty of it is, any of us can become a content creator if we really want to. So I think those of you who are going to be able to leverage content creation while still being a competitive driver, whether it's esports or real life, those are going to be the ones who generate the most sponsorship revenue going forward. Now, as someone who's gone all in on content creation recently, it's a lot more difficult than it seems. It brings on a whole new set of challenges like any other business. But I bring it up because I think it presents a solution that esports might not immediately cover. And that is maybe a combination of doing sim racing, enjoying sim racing, and making content potentially offers more opportunities than just doing esports alone. Now, ideally, if you can do content creation and esports, I think that might be the ideal solution, but I think doing both at the same time is really, really difficult. And there's been very few guys who've been successful at that. But honestly, I think if you can provide value to viewers, regardless of how fast you're on track, I think sponsors are gonna end up knocking on your door. For me personally, I've gone more the sim racing and content creation route rather than esports because I just don't think I would enjoy being hyper competitive in esports again. I'm one of those people that if I'm going to compete, I'm going to compete. And it'll be very hard for me to do anything else. I wanna encourage all of you guys to follow what makes you the most passionate. But I encourage you guys to bring up some ideas you have down in the comments below on how we can solve this problem. Because I think we're honestly closer than ever. Make sure you go join the Discord, link down in the description because we have conversations like this all the time and I'd really like to chat with you guys about this. So it's for those reasons that I don't personally compete in esports, but that doesn't mean you guys shouldn't. So with all that being said, see you guys on the next one.